Church, today we turn our attention on this Christmas morning to Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. We are going to be looking at Mary's Christmas story. Now, there are many segments of this found in Scripture, but today we're going to see this initial announcement that came to her concerning the Savior's birth and her role in being the mother of Jesus. When I look at this particular portion of the text, I am struck by the suddenness in which God was working in Mary's life. She's going about her everyday life. Uh, she's engaged. She soon will be married to Joseph. And then all of a sudden, an angel shows up and everything changes. I'm also struck by the miraculous working of God. We should be reminded today that God is a miracle-working God. He works in ways that we do not understand, nor can we grasp at times, but yet He is working that way. God works in suddenness. He works through miracles. And it is the sudden work of God in our lives that often creates fear within us because we're not sure how to respond to that. We're not... It doesn't always fit our uh, plans that we have. But God works in these sudden ways. And God also works in miraculous ways in our lives that can create fear as well. Mary experienced this fear, but she worked through it in such a way that we can learn from her how to respond to the suddenness and the miraculous working of God in our lives. And that's what we want to do. Can you think of a time when you were a child when your parents came to you and they said, they said, uh, get ready right now, we're about to leave and we're going to do whatever it may be that you're going to do. And you weren't expecting it. Maybe you're going to go to the store, maybe you're going to take a trip, uh, maybe it was time to leave for a certain appointment and you, you weren't ready for that. But they said, they came in and said, we're leaving in 10 minutes we're going. And you may say, well, where are we going? What are we doing? Why are we leaving? You may ask some questions. But ultimately, as a child, hopefully, you said, okay, and you went along with what the parents said you needed to do. Now, if you can think about it in a very practical way, I remember when I was a child, my memory comes to this, is that when we were, I was leaving the third grade, going into the fourth grade, and that summer, my parents came to me and they said, Mark, we're moving from Mississippi to Virginia. I thought, well, why? Well, what are we doing? I mean, my parents hadn't consulted me about the move, you know, and, and so, but we're moving. And I remember my grandmother saying to me when she found out we were moving, she said, well, Mark, you better get you a big coat. It's cold in Virginia compared to Mississippi. And I just, I don't know if there's a memory that's stuck in my mind. But I, we went along, I asked some questions, but ultimately, as a third grader going into the fourth grade, right, you just if the parents say you're doing it, you do it. And we did it. And I did it with a good attitude. And I remember uh, riding with my dad. We had two cars. Uh, my mom and my two sisters were in one car. My dad and myself were in another car. And uh, my distinct memory of my obedience to leave Mississippi and move to Virginia is that I rode with my dad in a little hatchback car. And he had put uh, some foam mats in the back of it. And I laid down and rode from Mississippi to Virginia just laying back there on those foam mats like a king. Now, no seat belts. How many of y'all rode in the back window of your car growing up? Look at that. Look how many of y'all survived that. It's amazing, isn't it? But we should strap up and wear our seat belts. It's a safe thing to do. But that's how we grew up. But I tell you that little story because I, I, I couldn't fully understand why we were moving. I didn't know all the ins and outs, but I was willing to say, yes, okay, and I followed. And, and so what we have here is that God comes through an angel and announces to Mary what the plan is, and she can't fully understand it, yet she will embrace it, although she is fearful, although she can't understand it. It is the sudden, miraculous work of God, yet she embraces it. And what you and I need to learn from Mary today is that we should live with no more hesitation from God. When he, hang on one second. Let me see if I can tighten this thing, see if that helps. No more hesitation, y'all. If God is a working God and an active God in your life and mine, and it may not be like 
Mary's story, but I'm here to tell you that I want you to understand that God is still a working, active God. Yes, who works in suddenness. Yes, who works miraculously. And when he calls us to obedience, we should have no hesitation. We should follow. And so I want us to learn this. And I want to share four key parts to Mary's Christmas story with you. And my desire is, at the end, you will see and learn from Mary and the activity of God that you and I are called to live without hesitation as we live in the flow of God's activity. The four key parts are simply this. God was working. Mary was troubled. Mary sought clarification. And Mary surrendered completely. Let's begin with the first, that God was working. This comes out of verse 26, 27, and 28. And here's what it says. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. These first three verses, we should learn. That God is always working. Now, he does not always work how we think he should work or when he should work. But I want you to walk away from these three verses acknowledging that God is always working. Here are the five evidences of God working. First, we see that it says in the sixth month. That is, when Elizabeth was in her sixth month of pregnancy, God sent Gabriel to Nazareth. Now, see, God, number one, had already been working in Elizabeth's life by calling her to be the mother of John the Baptist, the very one who would be the forerunner to Jesus. God was already working. Secondly, God was working through the angel Gabriel. This was a private conversation. God did not write in the sky. He did not bring some holistic, miraculous movement for everybody in the world to see or experience. But he was working through the angel Gabriel who came to have this private conversation with Mary. God may be speaking to you today. And others may not hear that movement in your heart. But God's working. See, God's working in people all around us. He may be working in Elizabeth's life. He may be working in your life. But God's always working. Thirdly, God was working in the town of Nazareth, a town literally that was despised. It was said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? But yet, listen, yet God was working in Nazareth. A town that people are, well, no, God can't work there. But may I say to you, God was working there. Don't think God will not work in your town, in your home, in your heart. God is always working somewhere in the world, in someone's life, to carry out his redemptive plan around the world. I love the story of Samuel Morris. I don't know if you've ever read the little book. There's several little uh, books and accounts of his life. He was a young man who was an, in, involved in the ravages of an intertribal warfare in Liberia, Africa in the early 1800s. He went by the name of Kabu. Kabu was um, taken captive, and God appeared to him, and God Uh, worked in his life, and I won't give the story away, but he worked in a miraculous way where he was able to escape. And in that escape, he came in contact with missionaries who led him to Christ. And he began to live a godly life. And and God led him from Africa to America. He came in the 1880s uh, on a voyage. And the voyage itself was an amazing story of how God, through this young man's life in full surrender, became a witness to any and everyone that saw him or knew him. He was filled with the Spirit of God. People were saved on the voyage. 
He found his way to Taylor University here in the United States. He became a leader among students. He grew in his call to be a servant of the Lord. His story is an unforgettable story of how God worked through one no one knew or no one could understand. Who would have ever thought that in Liberia, Africa, an intertribal uh, racial tension that was taking place in that part of the world that God would speak in such a miraculous way, but yet he did. That God would work through his life in such a miraculous way, but yet he did. He went by the American name Samuel Morris. What an amazing story this is. You should take time to get the book and read it and, and, and let that encourage you in that way. And I tell you this story simply because here is Mary. This is our next point, number four. God was working in the life of a young, unsuspecting virgin girl named Mary. Most of us, if we were told, who would you work through? Where would you work? Well, how would you accomplish it? It seems as though God was working in such a way that nobody could track how he was working. He was working uh, through Gabriel who came and spoke. He'd already worked through, he's working in Elizabeth's life. He comes to a little town nobody considers to be important. He speaks to a young girl that nobody sees as significant. Yet God is working. And God, lastly, was working his divine plan for humanity. If you'll turn over to Galatians chapter 4, I would like to read verse 4 and 5 to you. The full context of these verses will be 4 through 7, but let me read 4 and 5 to you to help you understand that God was working His divine plan for humanity. It says in verse 4 of Galatians chapter 4, but when the time had fully come, that is a significant statement because it tells us that God has a timetable. God is working His plan. And when the time had fully come, all the prophecies had been given all the way back to the book of Genesis, all the way to this moment in time, and it had fully come. God sent His Son, right? Isn't this the Christmas story? The message of Christ loving the world by sending His Son, born of a woman, born under law. Why? To redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of sons. That's the Christmas story. And what's so beautiful about it is, is that we can say that God was working His redemptive plan. These five evidences are beautiful. They're powerful. He worked in Elizabeth's life. He worked through the angel Gabriel. He worked in the town of Nazareth. He worked through an unsuspecting virgin girl named Mary as he worked his divine plan for humanity. God was working. It may not have seemed like it then. In the hustle and bustle of the day, maybe others didn't recognize it, but God was working. It may not seem like it now to you in our world, in the hustle and bustle of the world, but I want you to know God is working. God is alive. He's working out His plan. One of the challenges that you and I have is that we don't have the ability to see the holistic picture that God does. Usually we're pretty singular in our understanding of things. Uh, we're not very good at spiritual multitasking or spiritual understanding holistic pictures of God's work. Usually, one of our great downfalls is we think more through our own self lens than we do the holistic lens of God. But God was working. And we need to see that and understand it. Secondly, I want you to see Mary was troubled in this working of God, verses 29 through 33. It says that Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. And you would have been as well, more than likely, all of us. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. What a message this was to take in. And it's easy to understand, I think, to see the element of fear in which she had. Mary was human. Mary was very human. And I think the element of fear, and it says that she was greatly troubled and full of fear. I think two of the most obvious things 
uh, factors for her fear would have been these. One is her personal plans, her engagement. Um, this announcement really changed everything for her in that regard. Secondly was public opinion, the embarrassment factor, the very fact that her life could be at risk and that others would stone her for being pregnant before marriage. And that was the practice of the day. We don't, we don't get that. We don't think about it like that. We don't understand it. But both the personal plans and the public opinion of others and the result of those two things would have created fear in her like none other. It was uncertainty. But yet the message was real. It was clear. It was happening to her. It came from an angel. How would she overcome her personal plans and her public opinion of others? By trusting God, living by faith. Faith is the only thing that overcomes fear. And fear is typically part of how God works because he asks us to join him. He asks us to believe in that which we cannot fully grasp and understand. That's why faith has to work. And why would she need to overcome her personal plans and her public opinion? It's because God's plan is greater than hers. Here it is. Here's the great plan. Which one, if I was to put them on a scale, you think should win? Mary's personal plans and public opinion or God's plan? Here's God's plan. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be greater and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Which one is of greater value? Isn't that our struggle for you and I? When God moves suddenly, when God is moving miraculously to carry out His plan, His activity in our lives, that we struggle with this, like this is what I was planning on doing, but here's what God's doing. What I have found in my life is that if I will surrender what God's doing, it is a testimony to the fact that I believe that God's plan is greater than my plan. And that's how we should see it. And that's how we must embrace the work of God. The third thing I want us to see is Mary sought clarification, verse 34 through 37. She says, how will this be? This is, not a, this is not a question of doubt, church. This is a question of clarification. It says, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. That's a pretty good question, right? A pretty common sense question. But the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. Man, he threw that in there. I mean, you know, um, miraculous conception. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, she's with a child. And then he... Sums it all up by saying, for nothing is impossible with God. I love verse 37. It is such a reminder to me, and it should be to every one of us, that God does the impossible. And we must believe that. She is seeking clarification. How will this be since she is a virgin? And I think that we can learn from this. I think it's okay to ask honest questions and to be open. And say, okay, here's my question. Now let me receive an answer. And I think then we have to listen. I think even in the answer that was given to Mary, it was a call for faith. It wasn't a demand that I got to understand this completely. I don't think Mary could understand all of it completely. She couldn't put all the pieces together logically. This was the sudden, miraculous work of God. And see, the battle for faith, for you and I as it was for Mary, is to believe despite our natural senses, the circumstances around us, or the public opinions of others. The angel did answer her and proclaimed the fulfillment of the prophecies of God's Word. 
And oftentimes when we ask, Lord, help me understand this, he will give us um, truth from his word. It's still the word. And the question is, will we believe it by faith? I was reading this week in Genesis 18, verses 13 through 15, where Abraham and Sarah received a message, right, about a child being born to them. And here's what it says. It says, Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? (laughs) Is there, church, is there anything too hard for the Lord? Doesn't it say in our text right here, for nothing is impossible with God? It does. And there is nothing too hard for God. He said, I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid. Just like Mary experienced fear, but watch what she did. And I'm not being harsh on her. I'm not sure how any of us would respond, but here's what she did. So she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, yes, you did laugh. Hmm. Are we laughing at what God wants to do in and through our lives? When he wants to suddenly, miraculously do through us in the fulfillment of his plan for his glory, something that we cannot calculate, that the world would say could never happen, yet nothing is too hard for God and nothing is impossible for God to do. I think there's a lesson to be learned in Scripture here, both from Sarah and from Mary and putting the two together, that we are called by faith to believe God for the impossible. The fourth thing that I want us to learn from Mary is this. Fourthly, Mary's surrendered, that she surrendered completely, verse 38. I love this verse. This is her response to the question and that she asked and the answer that she received. She said, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Wow. Then the angel left her. Here is a beautiful picture of Mary exercising faith toward God. She turned her fear into faith. She had an answer to her question, and she did not fully understand it. But here's what she accepted. Listen, accepted by faith. Three major things. One, that the Holy Spirit could and would conceive in her a child. Listen, her long-awaited Savior. Really? Yes, she believed that. Secondly, that God would protect her from being stoned since she was not yet married. Okay, go ahead. You're going to protect me. She believed that. And then that Elizabeth was of old age and had conceived a child. That one within itself would have taken great faith to believe, but yet she believed all three of these when she said, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. How, how, how did she do this? I will tell you how she did it. She believed, verse 37, when the angel said to her, when Gabriel said, for nothing is impossible with God. That's what she believed. That's why she was able to say what she said and surrender her life completely to the Lord. And we should understand this surrender. There's three parts to it. When she said, I am the Lord's, what she's acknowledging is ownership. I'm not my own. I'm God's. Secondly, when you read it, you say, I am the Lord's servant. Ownership plus servanthood. This was her calling was to be a servant. I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me, as you have said, is her availability. As you said, here I am. Ownership, calling, availability. You and I, we should know who we are, that we are the Lord's. That's ownership. We should know, uh, you should know that you are a servant of God as his child. That's our calling. And we should know that we are the Lord's servant and we should be available to him whatever it is that he asks us to do. 
when God's working, he will find those who are available for him to work through. You know, it says in 2 Chronicles 16, 9, For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may uh, strongly support those whose heart is completely his. He's looking. And I wonder when he looks in my heart, just as he looked in Mary's heart at this time in history, and when he looks in your heart, what does he find? Does he find a righteous individual that loves him? Does he find someone that will ask honest questions but adjust their life by faith to the fear that they face? Philip Yancey, I love his definition of faith. He says, faith means believing in advance what will only make sense in reverse. And how true that is. I am convinced, without a shadow of a doubt, that we are blessed when we believe God's promises. Blessing is not a life of ease, but one of fulfillment. Listen to me. To believe doesn't mean that your life becomes completely easy. But it does mean that you fulfill what God calls you to. Giving birth in a stable was not easy. Nor was it easy to watch a son that you love die on an old rugged cross. Those were fulfillment. They were not easy, but they were fulfilling. It's an amazing story. It's a life-changing story. It is our Christmas story. And Mary was right in the center of it. And her response to it made all the difference for her in the fulfillment of God's will. I think about sharing this story with people. At times, I may be fearful about that. But I take that fear and I say, well, no, Lord, this is what Christmas is all about. And by faith, I'm going to share this. When the world says we should not share because they don't want to feel conviction of sin, it is the very reason why the Savior came, to convict of sin, to save from sin, so that we could be in relationship with the one who created us, Almighty God. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. We are entrusted with this beautiful message, this Christmas message. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? If so, today you can celebrate in the richness of knowing the Savior of the world. If you never have, I invite you to receive Christ as your Savior. That is the good news that is being shared all around the world. It's what changed my life and it can change yours. And I want to ask if you would at this moment to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want you to think about, as a believer who knows Christ, about the faith that Mary exercised in the working of God, the sudden, miraculous working of God. And thank Him for this testimony of her life. And then I want to ask you to reflect in your own life. How is God working? Would you ask him that question right now? God, how are you working in my life? And however God responds to you, are you willing to, by faith, no longer hesitate, but walk in full obedience to how God's working? Whatever that may be. It may be something large. It may be something small. And you may not even discern what it is at the moment, but would you say to him, God, I will trust you, whatever it is you would ask me to do. I think that's our call as we study the Christmas message today. But then if you're here and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, today the greatest Christmas ever for you would be to receive Christ as your Savior. But to do that, you need to acknowledge that you're a sinner. The Bible says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
That simply means that we're born sinners with sin in our hearts. We inherited that from Adam and Eve all the way down to today. Everyone born is born with a heart filled with sin. And the only thing the Bible says that will take care of that sin is our Savior, Jesus, the one who was born at Christmas, but the one who grew and went to the cross, from the cradle to the cross, to die for our sins. He shed his blood. He gave his life. He made the way. He joined us to God. He was the righteous one who was without sin. He was buried and rose again, and he overcame death. He is the Savior of the world. Emmanuel, God with us, the Savior of the world. That is the message of Christmas. Do you believe in Jesus, the Savior of the world? If so, tell him, I'm willing to turn away from my sins. I'm willing to receive Christ, the Savior of the world. And just turn your life over to him and say, I receive you and thank you for forgiving me of my sins. The Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord in that way, and you're honest and true about that, that he comes into your heart and he forgives you of your sins. And he now lives within your heart. That is the greatest gift you will ever receive in life. To have your sins forgiven and have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. What a beautiful thing that is. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit comes and lives within us. So, Lord, I thank you for anyone, both here in this sanctuary or who's watching by TV, who has prayed to receive Christ this morning, the greatest gift that they could ever receive. Thank you for saving me. As a little boy, when I prayed to receive Christ at the age of eight, you worked so faithfully in my life, and then in full surrender at 18 to begin to follow you, Lord. I thank you. Lord, help us to learn from Mary how to overcome our fears of our personal plans and public opinions and simply say, Lord, I believe that you do the impossible and nothing is impossible for you and anything you want to do, here I am. I surrender to you right now, this Christmas day, for your glory. So God, as we enter into this time of invitation, we just ask that you would have your way in our lives today. We love you. In the name of Jesus, amen.